Thank you very much indeed. So thank you um, very much, Guilherme, and, uh, and all the other speakers um, for outlining the value of, of smart mobility. Um, and just as that was a brilliant session, we've now got another really good session to come, uh, looking at sustainable and smart management for the built environment. Um, we're looking at two key case studies, if you like, um, the uh, uh, both about managing large numbers of buildings in an effective way. So we're looking at uh, the Amsterdam University um, uh, campus and, and the buildings, all the buildings that are part of that. Um, and we're looking at uh, Helsinki and the, the many buildings that um, are managed by the municipality uh, that need to be managed well. Now, there are three great reasons why this is an important session. Um, First of all, one of the key issues as we move towards net zero for cities is how to manage buildings. Um, and it's, it's a kind of a, a two-edged sword, really. It's, it's about the fact that many of the buildings in our cities are old and are not very well necessarily prepared to, to manage energy efficiently. But on the other hand, if we knock them down and build new brilliantly designed buildings that are very energy efficient, that itself is, is a huge um, uh, carbon uh, footprint. So um, how can you manage the buildings that there are? Um, how can you make the right decisions about building new or building um, or, or managing the old ones better um, to ensure that we can move towards net zero? So uh, this is a key reason why this is important. Um, secondly, um, it's a great move towards digital twins. Uh, digital twins aren't like a suddenly you get everything all together and you know everything about everything. The way to move towards digital twins is to start to manage different aspects of your city better using data and step by step build them together until you can share between them. And clearly this is a great first step towards that. And then the third reason why this is a really good session is because um, we're going to start off by looking um, at Amsterdam, looking at it from a management perspective. What are the key drivers? Why are they doing it? What do they want to achieve? How do they manage? Uh, how do they measure success? So all the key, uh, starting very much from the key management drivers for that. And then we're going to look in Helsinki and see um, what sort of data platform can we put in place to enable uh, the management um, uh, goals and, and objectives to be met. So um, that's today's session. Um, we're going to start with uh, Karen Williams um, presenting, but with Mark Van Wees there um, from both from the Amsterdam University of Applied Science, I think. Uh, but they're going to be uh, going through uh, what they've learned and, and what's been done in Amsterdam. So over to you, Karen. Thanks, Michael. I'll just um, share my screen. There we go. Can you hear me and see me OK? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. So we'll we'll begin. So um, first of all, thank you for inviting us to participate in this session. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about our journey. So the journey of the Amsterdam University of Applied Science and also the University of Adam, Amsterdam's journey into smart management for the built environment. So first of all, to set the scene, um, the both entities, the two universities, have um, recently published their strategic plan for the next four years. And they, they developed these strategic plans separately and without any coordination between the two entities. But it's very useful um, and for, fortunate that the two universities identified two key factors in their strategic plan. Firstly, sustainability is big on top of their agenda, but also the digital agenda is there as well. So digitalization is prominent within their strategic plan. So that really helps, to, helps us to give some uh, moment, momentum to what we're attempting to do at the university. So to set the scene, uh, we have um, the University of Amsterdam has a very large campus that is in the center of the, the historic center of Amsterdam. 
and is working with the, the municipality of Amsterdam to develop a master plan for renovation of this area. So this also gives us a unique opportunity to uh, introduce initiatives that, um, that tick the boxes for digitalization uh, in order to improve the systems that we currently have in place so that we can uh, have more transparency about how the, day, how the buildings perform and also uh, use it as an opportunity also for research and innovation. So here is an example of one of the uh, smart uh, building develop developments that is currently uh, under development. And you will see that we are, we are now moving to using approaches such as BIM models in the developments. So here we have um, got a BIM model on the right hand side, and we could use this BIM model that's been developed to form the basis of a digital twin, uh, where we can do simulations on, at a digital level and then roll that out to the real building once the building is completed. So the opportunities are all here, they're all ready to go. So there's a lot of information here, but I wanted to give you an impression of some of the typical activities um, and a hypothesis of some of the typical activities that we see as um, be, being recognized as data-driven monitoring of building energy performance. So firstly, um, we see it as being able to enhance the collection quality and integration of not just energy data, but also other building related data, such as occupancy um, and uh, CO2 uh, measurements, which is very, very relevant of the at the moment with um, the pandemic. We also look to explore approaches to integrate um, so different sources of data, so dynamic data from the buildings coming from metering and sensors, but also with uh, including things like static data, such as floor area, and also data from uh, drawings and measurements that can be um, then digitally um, approached. They would also be looking at to look at interoperability and cloud-based solutions. So this information is then readily available across the organization. It's not sitting in silos or in, in separate um, systems that only a single individual has access to. We are looking to, for new or enhanced uh, existing open source data analytics da dashboards and prediction tools. Uh, so this is um, at the moment we have a lot of building multiple building management systems across the organization and building management systems are great for controlling the buildings, but they don't provide you with the analytics that you need to, to get insights into how the buildings are performing or how you can tune uh, those buildings. And it would be nice to have things like prediction tools so that we can look at performance and see how it would uh, what it would look like over time in the future. Um, you would look at things like improved tools for digital simulation and digital twinning, as with the BIM model that was shown in the previous slide. Uh, you could consider developing, enhancing and integrating existing systems of open da data sharing platforms, uh, refining and integrating uh, building data reference architectures and also to, uh, to promote fair data management practice, practices so that, build, so that data can be easily found and accessed and can be reused um, and also consider the use of data, not just purely at an operational level, but also for research purposes. And then to, uh, to work towards a, a building digital log, logbook and digital data exchange platforms so that the information about our buildings can then be shared more widely across uh, European platforms to provide more insights into how buildings are performing. And what we see is that if we were to adopt the measures mentioned, uh, here are some of the impacts that we would ex expect to see. Uh, we would expect to see some real use cases with business potential, so smart energy services that valorize high quality building performance data. We would look to demonstrate that the pro proposed solutions allow to significant, significantly improve the monitoring of our building stock performance, but not only the monitoring, but also the performance of so being able to tune uh, the building so that you can optimize to the uh, the most possible, and also to demonstrate that the data driven monitoring increases energy performance. So this is what we would, this is what we're hoping uh, to pursue at the Amsterdam uh, universities. So one tool that we are looking at, which is already in existence, is the smart readiness indicator, which was developed by the European Union. So this was developed as part of the um, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and is relatively new. And the interesting thing for us in terms of using this approach is that it, it breaks um, the approach down into three 
key areas. So it considers uh, the readiness of a building to respond to the needs of occupants. So it, it puts the occupants high in, in terms of importance and the need for a building to be able to respond to those occupants um, requirements. And then it also considers the building operation. So you want the building to operate efficiently. So um, it needs to be uh, tuned so that it is not wasteful in, uh, with energy. But then you also need to consider the readiness of the building to respond to the needs of the grid. How flexible are our buildings to be able to uh, turn equipment off? when the grid is under pressure or to be able to feed energy back into the grid if that's possible possible with storage options that might be available within a building so as this is already quite well um, developed we are looking to adopt this approach in the university of amsterdam so to give you an overview of the organization because it's fairly complex here is the current situation so we have the university of amsterdam and we have the University of Applied Sciences on the right, but the, the management of facility services is shared across these two organizations. And then a key point is that the maintenance and energy management uh, services are outsourced to third party contractors, and this adds an additional layer of complexity. But you'll see that the real estate management for both entities is completely separate and also the development of strategic plans and policies is also separate. So this creates um, in itself challenges. So it's a large portfolio of buildings, around 100 buildings that are sort of spread across the city of Amsterdam. It's a mixture of old buildings, historical buildings, and some new buildings that are in development. As I've mentioned, quite a number of services are outsourced. The universities operate as a lean organization. So outsourcing is common practice. Um, the real estate policy and management not being shared creates some, some uh, challenges that need to be overcome. And there is also a lack of in-house knowledge, capacity and processes for innovation. So say, for example, uh, smart buildings are um, uh, given that that role is given to a person, that person with that task then has very little um, uh, expertise in that area to be able to deliver. So we see a real need for either to bring in expertise or to upskill existing staff so they can so they can um, attempt to uh, achieve what was mentioned in the previous slide. So as I mentioned before, we, we're looking at the smart readiness indicator and we did our own sort of rough uh, assessment of the university. And as you can see, we, we in the first assessment, we scored very low. So um, on the bottom, you'll see that for energy saving and operation, our score at the moment is, is around um, 30 percent. And we hope that by um, addressing some of the things that were mentioned, we hope to bring that up into the sort of low 70 percent mark in terms of how our buildings respond to user needs. Again, quite low, at around 30 percent. And there is an opportunity to increase this up to close to 90 percent in terms of responding to the needs of the grid. Um, we're not there. So we're, we're very low in that. And we would hope then um, in the course of the, the next few years to be able to bring that up to around 40% uh, by using um, demand um, response, uh, using any storage options that are available on the campus or being able to export excess renewable energy back into the grid. So as, as I hope I've set the scene, uh, the universities uh, that we're dealing with is fairly complex. We have a wide group of stakeholders and it makes it very complex indeed. So we have the building and portfolio owners, we have asset managers, facility managers and policy officers. And some of the main things are that, um, you know, we have these third party contractors. So we have to bring all of these people mentioned here along on the journey. So it, the journey to, to, for digitalization crosses across all the, all the areas of the university it doesn't just sit with facility management it also touches the policy officers we need the advice of energy advisors but um, there are at the moment there are disconnects between management or uh, policy level and then the operations um, so we see that there is a need to bring these um, departments or divisions together uh, to make this happen on the plus side we have research we have researchers um, so we're an education establishment so we have a lot of in-house expertise and knowledge that we can utilize in doing this 
So it's going to be a collaboration. Um, and we must not forget that the building end user and uh, end users and occupants are also a very important part of this so we will we will be involving occupants and we will be testing out different approaches and getting their response as to um, whether or not they felt it worked or it should be improved and of course we also need investment so we need um, financial institutes and investors to support this as well so here are some of the key for the university se sector here are some of the key drivers um, so reputation is number one within the university sector. So universities are playing a leading role in demonstrating how we can achieve large scale emissions reduction. And we need to do that also. So we see that as being the number one driver for the universities. Also research and education is one of our core business activities. So we need to enable world leading research and this can feed into uh, that those opportunities by supporting education. And also we see the university as being, it's, it's an attempt to rather than testing things at a pilot scale, we can test things at a large real world scale. So we see the university as a living lab. The, uh, the approach to smart um, buildings and um, data, it also provides an opportunity to accelerate energy innovation. So we can transform our cities, uh, our campuses into smart cities and create models that can be re replicated beyond the boundaries of the campus. So we, we want to um, learn from our experiment and then pass on that knowledge to, uh, to the city, the municipality of Amsterdam, but also share that knowledge with other universities. Another driver is to support the strategic ambition. So within the strategic plan, there are targets for climate, energy and digitalization. So uh, in doing this, we will we hope to fulfill those strategic ambitions. We want to develop partnerships with industry and research co collaborations and develop technologies that can be tested locally. As I mentioned, we would like to share the knowledge and information that we learn as we go on this journey um, with other universities and more broadly. And for funding, we want to use the university infrastructure to attract research funding and to in order to create world class facilities. So looking at some of the barriers that we face in trying to do this, there are many. Uh, so in terms of financial barriers, there are no um, there are limited financial resources available within the university. So we need we may need to look outside to bring in to, to attract grants and additional funding. There's no specific budget set aside to tackle this issue. Um, so things like metering and censoring and the ICT connections, they're not that that it's very difficult for us to use the traditional business ca case models that exist within the university to have funding um, given to these projects. So we would look to develop alternative business case models in order to achieve that. And also there's a there's a impression, there's a perceived impression about how much it would cost to do this as well, um, which we see as a barrier. In terms of the political barriers, um, we are lacking some policy framework around smart buildings and digitalization. So we have um, we have strategies uh, for sustainability um, as, a, as a broad topic. But when we want to uh, drill down into that, there is no specific policy for smart buildings. And without a policy, then there is then no action. So one of the first things that we need to tackle is the development of policies um, for both, both organizations. There is a disconnect between um, the real estate management and the policy side. So we there are institutional uh, issues that need to be tackled um, and we are lacking a, a detailed roadmap and clear planning to achieve their strategic ambitions. We have a roadmap, but it doesn't articulate clearly enough how we can achieve the targets in the strategic plan. So at an institutional level, uh, there is a lack of leadership or ownership for this topic. Um, we have the challenge of outsourcing the energy management of the university. So the targets, the energy reduction targets are the responsibility to, of a third party through an energy performance contract. And that means that we are vulnerable because we do not have, have ownership of our, our own data um, in order to assess or monitor or verify how the, how the buildings are performing against the targets. We have a very small team uh, that work within facility services on energy man management and performance of the buildings. Uh, so no dedicated team tackling uh, th this issue. 
The, the current systems and processes do not allow for innovation, so we have a very traditional structure within the university, and there is very little um, opportunity to, to break free from, that, from those processes, um, and that's what is needed in this case. We also see a lack of uh, integration between facility services and operations, and also with the ICT department. They both uh, talk in different languages, they don't understand each other, uh, and so it makes it very difficult to, to get projects like this um, underway. On the technical side, there is a lack of understanding. Uh, so, so can we, so Karen, just, we, yeah. we need to be moving on fairly yeah. quickly. Um, it's great stuff, but let's keep moving. Thank you. Yep. So on the technical side, there's generally a lack of understanding, um, generally, and there is some um, resistance. And these are all things that we need to tackle. So just uh, quickly running through the next steps, we need to address the planning and address the strategy and set up a monitoring and evaluation framework. Engagement is a big piece. We need to contact all the stakeholders that were mentioned. And also we look we want to benchmark against best practice research and development. Um, is also a key part of this. And we want to look at things like digital twinning. We need to build capacity in our staff and also our contractors. We need to look for alternative business case models to support investment in this. And then we need to look to upscaling. So looking at upscaling within our own org organization to from a, from a building level to a campus level and then to the city of Amsterdam. And then finally, just to bring you um, an idea of best practice that we, we could use for benchmarking would be to look at a university such as Monash University in Melbourne, who started their journey on this about five years ago. So they're way ahead of us in terms of what we would like to achieve. They, they won an award, a United Nations Award for um, change, and they've committed a, a large amount of money to uh, invest in energy transformation. Their goals for their buildings go beyond building code, so they seek, op, seek for all their new buildings to be ele fully electric and passive house standard. They have, a, they have support at the highest level, the vice chancellor level, and they take a top-down approach, which is something that we also need to follow. And they have an actionable roadmap, which they developed with industry experts. They have a connection between their facility services and their ICT department. They work together, they cross over. ICT people work within facility services. And they've also developed industry partners and collaboration with uh, network service providers. And they're currently working on the next generation electricity microgrid so that they can automatically balance generation op uh, operation and demand. And um, apologies if I've gone over time, um, uh, but that now concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. It, the difficulty is we don't have the time. It's really fascinating. And I'm sure lots of people would like to keep it, get in touch with you and find out more. But let's move quickly to Timo. Um, no problem. And, and please, if you have questions, please, if you put them in the Q&A, then we can make sure they get answered, even if there's no time now. Thanks, Timo. Over to you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and, and the good, good thing in, in today's presentation is that, that I could actually I'm going to just replace our logos into Karen's presentations because we, we of course, share pretty much the same things. But I'm, I'm digging a little bit deeper in, in my side and, and what is happening in the Helsinki and especially what, what has been happening in, with the support of innovation projects like Horizon 2020 in the earlier. So quick facts, uh, you of course know, know what Helsinki is, but a couple of things from the energy side. Uh, that uh, city owns an energy company, Helen, that is providing both electrical and, and, uh, and heat and cooling as well. 90% of the buildings in, in the city, within the city limits are in, in uh, the district heating and cooling network. Uh, and as a facility owner or facility manager, the city has about, owns about 1,800 uh, facilities in, in the, that are like service buildings, uh, offices, hospitals, schools, and so on. So, so the uh, apartment buildings are on top of these. And, and the total value of facilities is about 8 billion euros, but excluding housing again. And, and the median age of buildings is about 60 years. So we are starting to see, see where the problem is. Uh, the current facility strategy is, of course, it started uh, with a couple of uh, specific actions like, like that, that we would need to have a building energy management system in place. Uh, and and uh, based on, on these, this insight that is coming out from the data, then it, it would be possible to systematically implement a feasible actions to improve energy efficiency, uh, to define target consumption profiles and monitor them. 
uh, to develop new types of indicators and also include operative effectiveness, especially in, in the educational side, which is very important because the uh, schools are not necessarily populated or that they're occupied throughout the day. But uh, the budget of in, in the of the budget of educational division in the city of Helsinki, uh, the space costs are about 18 percent. So so that is quite a significant chunk of, of the money spent in that side. And, and of course, also the facility strategy is part of the climate neutral Helsinki 2030 program. And, and that program is specific in, in a way that it defines specific goals. And of course, those are measured as well. So, so there is this kind of chain of, of um, actions that there is an action, there are tactical meters that are then followed, what is an, uh, electrical energy consumption, what is heating energy consumption. And then there is the uh, strategy meter that, that what does it mean in terms of uh, uh, carbon footprint in that sense. So uh, in, in terms of 1800 buildings, uh, many of the buildings or most of the buildings have a building automation systems. Some of them might be 20, 30 years old, even older. So, so as, as a data exercise, this is of course quite a challenging one. Uh, and, and it has started from, from uh, going through buildings one by one. Uh, in, in some cases, we have been just connecting to the, to the building automation network. In some cases, we have been connected to the, to the, to the actual monitoring system in, in place. Uh, in, in recent years, some vendors have been started to provide cloud versions of their automation system. So, so there could be like advanced algorithms, advanced analytics would be part of the cloud service. And, and then what is inside the facility, inside the building is still remaining quite basic. So basic automation logic, when something is beyond uh, a set point, then something else must happen. And, and the building energy management system, that is uh, where, where the rollout is, is at the moment also, also in place that has been already providing quite useful because it is, uh, uh, it's, it's important also from the technology point of view to, to keep in mind that, that when we are looking for effectiveness in, in the energy, uh, we don't necessarily need to jump to the AI and, and to the optimization of, of, of optimization algorithms as the first place, because the, the first thing that we are looking for is, is just major failures. So, so we could have just, just that there is a gap in the policy or operational policies so that, that we haven't changed the filter in, in the ventilation system on, on two years or so. So, so there, can be, there are these kind of mistakes and identifying those, those kind of mistakes is not necessarily requiring uh, AI or, or anything advanced. So it, it just need, need, we just need to connect the stuff together. And, and also, of course, uh, what started as an urban platform, we are starting to call it urban data space nowadays just because of the interoperability reasons. So, so how do we see this kind of open data platform complementing the building energy management system, building automation systems, and how could that provide them then something additional? Like as an example, you combine it with the data that is coming from, from the uh, 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 heating and, uh, and electric energy system, uh, uh, distributed system operators, uh, transmission system operators, utility companies like water company. Uh, if I IoT is needed to complement the data, then LoRaWAN as, as, and, and put the, the, all this together and create these kind of like data products that would then be the indicators that would be helpful. Uh, helpful to, to operate this kind of fleet or building stock. And uh, again, getting back to the volumes or, 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 or what it is, 1800 buildings, what it means is that uh, if we implement as an example, smart readiness indicator, and it would take one, one hour for one person to enter the, the numbers or collect and enter the numbers of a single building, it would mean that one person will, will need to spend one year just basically entering details of the buildings into the system. And that doesn't sound like a feasible thing to do. So, so of course, when, when thinking about these kind of new data products and in, in indicators have to also think about the feasibility, or then we need to put more effort on, on trying to find out alternative ways how these indicators are created. Uh, the uh, urban data space, as, as we see it, as, as, as mentioned, it is it has evolving from from the urban platform concept, the EIPSCC. Uh, I have it in, in the objectives in the next slide, but but also tackling it in, in here. So so the starting point was that that we we tried to first identify that that what are the technologies that the city already has in place, 
so that we, we could reuse them, we could also reuse the skills and capabilities that are available within the organization before uh, rolling out anything new, any new technologies or any new platforms. So, so as an example, the data integration, the data fusion component that is used in here has been used for, for ages in the city, but it has been used in the, in the integration of financial data. So, so because of that background, there are lots of consultants, their licenses are in place and, and we just start to use it also in the building data. So it is a production grade and uh, all the governance stuff is in place. Uh, the stream processing part is something that is also uh, important because there are a lot more and more uh, requests for this kind of situational awareness that, that we would need to have faster, faster understanding uh, of, of what is happening there. And also the volumes are quite high that in, in, in the data terms that in one single building automation system, there could be 2,000, 3,000 data points, 1,800 buildings. Again, we are talking about a couple of million of data points that are upgraded every 15 minutes. So, so it is a massive amount of data, but 99% of that data is not necessary. Uh, we just know, know, don't know which part of that the one person is. So, so we need to have a point in, in the pipeline where we can make the decisions that I want to start following also this, the, this data point and I want to create a data product out of that. So the self-service is quite important thing here. Uh, the, the city has currently about 950 ICT systems. Uh, it, it is easy to also see that because of these volumes, we cannot have a data engineer for every system in place. So, so we need to start building on capabilities. We need to start building on, on, on skills in a way that, that uh, self-service could be done in, in creating the data products and also creating the analytical side, the BI stuff in here. And, and it has been already said within the city organization also because of the other reasons that Power BI is like the next, next Excel. So everyone needs to have their own insight and, and, and that is the, the tool for that. So, so uh, data is processed live. Uh, processing means uh, you, could, you could create advanced analytics on, on, on live or you can just enhance the context or enhance the metadata on top of that. And, and for that, of course, we use outside control vocabularies uh, using the W3C uh, SCOS protocol. So, so using also, also a national infrastructure on that, that we created an ontology of uh, ISO 80,000 VSI system uh, so that, that we could have a reliable uh, place when we are referring something in terms of, of metadata. And, and uh, cannot emphasize too much of the word control it here that, that it, the vocabulary is something that cannot be a self-service. So, so you need to have a stable, uh, stable uh, list of uh, terms that uh, you are referring to. Uh, data catalog work is something that we are currently working on. And this is exactly tacking off of the issue of thousands of data points that, that we don't want to do with. So, so you need to have a, have, a, have a service where you can just sit down and see what is available, uh, what has been made available and, and what the latest values there are. So on, on the objective side, uh, the holistic view on data, situational awareness, that has been a rising topic in here. Of course, we see that there are multiple domains of stakeholders. There could be quite surprising uh, new uses for the data. As an example, if we had uh, the readings of the outdoor temperature sensors out of the 1800 uh, buildings around the city, it would be a very nice data set to understand microclimates better. And, and, and these kind of cases are, are just, they are all over the place. We just need to share and, and listen, of course, as well. So, so using products that are already there and, and the focus is more in integration and focus is more in the, in the governance and operations than in, in programming something new or, or creating new code. Uh, developing anyhow skills and capabilities. So, so trying to empower the users and trying to support the self-service. And, and the case of FME product as, as an ETL tool is, is a good one. Uh, so ETL is, is quite a traditional way of, of transforming data from one source to other, connect, connecting systems between each others. And uh, the, the tools are actually available in, in almost every city, but they are not necessarily used by the ICT department F, because FME as a tool is something that is an industry standard in the city geographical department, creating maps and, and creating the download services for Inspire. So in, in surprisingly, great number of cities there are already licenses in place there are skilled people in place but they are not ICT people so have to have to be 
careful when, when jumping into the conclusions that, that do we have the skills to, to move to this kind of direction? You might have. Uh, the life cycle management system is, is quite important. Uh, the, there has to be ownership on the, on the products. There has to be uh, specific uh, methods on how to, uh, how to sunset, how to onboard new services there, what needs to happen as part of that. And, and that is, of course, of course, something that is uh, getting more complex the more systems you have, so, or more services you have. And one, one way to limit this is, or make it easier to tackle this, is to make sure that you are not having too many systems in place. Uh, reusability open ecosystems, uh, open ecosystems is also quite important, so that, that uh, in, in order to limit the amount of code and customization and, and proprietary things that you need to develop, a look for products that are then easier to connect between two, two things. And finally, supporting the digital twin. Uh, so, so we also have already have created the Energy Atlas, which is en enhancing the city GML with uh, energy attributes so that can mon monitor every building within the city limits, not just city owned buildings, but every building, their energy consumption and, and uh, practical steps, what might need to be next. And, and we are now working on the ISO 55000 asset management. So, so the idea is that in, in the uh, digital twin, of course, it is not just a static snapshot of, of data, but it is also a system that should be able to trigger events and processes and define who the stakeholders are, who the actors are in each specific case. So with that, I'm concluding today. And of course, we can continue in, in Q&A and, and even chat. We still have a few minutes left. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, um, Timo. We've, we've, we've only got five minutes. In fact, we want to make sure we, we, we finish slightly um, before time, if possible. Um, so I'm just going to actually ask um, if you're both of you, Karen, um, Tim, and also Mark, um, if you're able to, do you have any quick pieces of advice for anyone who wants to follow your, <laughs> your roadmap? <laughs> and that's, I know that's a difficult question, but yes. Um, no, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Mark. Okay, the, 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 the risk of these, these, uh, these processes within organizations as the university with also municipalities is to focus on, on technology, technology development. However, beforehand work, work on the absorption capacity of your organization mm -hmm. at the same time. And then on the basis of these two roadmaps, but first developing the technology solutions and then preparing your organization to be able to adopt and use that, use an incremental approach. Uh, and don't forget, don't forget the acceptability or the involvement of the stakeholders. We had a recent event at the university where they installed occupancy, occupancy cameras in a lecture hall and this, uh, completely anonymous but the students wanted them to, to be out so they removed <laughs> it and that's that's serious yes. that's serious so that's so the three lines acceptance user user involvement organizational reform and capacity building and technology development they should go in hand brilliant thank you can, oh, yeah. can, can i just add to that as well i think that you really need buy-in at the top so from a project that I'm, I'm working on, because I'm trying to do this from the perspective of as a consultant, I come across these roadblocks all the time. I get people just slamming down my project um, because there hasn't been an initiative that's become from above. So it really needs to come from the top of the organization and filter down for it, for, for, in my opinion, for it to work effectively. I know there is valuing sort of grassroots movements and activities in the community, but for a large organization, this directive needs to come from the top down. And what's a good what's a good um, argument for those people at the top why they should support this? Well, they know that we're all seeking to address the Paris Climate Agreement. It's on everybody's agenda, and this and digitalization of their buildings and their all their equipment will help them facilitate and meet those goals. So it's all part of the same puzzle. So we just need Brilliant. to do it. Just get on with it. Good. Just Timo. Yeah, Timo. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, as, as a conclusion, the most important thing is to start working on it and, uh, and moving on. So, so it doesn't matter what is the scale of, of the first experiments, because it's the whole point is that, that you learn by doing. And, and, and you, cannot just, you, you can wait forever if you're wait, waiting for a perfect solution that is cheap and, and does everything. And it, it's, it's not, not the way necessary. 
and of course also with these kind of small experiments small pilots you can also show to the top management that this is a real available thing Good, yeah. that, that we, we can have have the uh, uh, twenty percent savings, but we we just don't know which building that twenty percent <laughs> saving is. So be, in for, in order to do that, we need to do something that is that is holistic and, and covers everything. Brilliant! Thanks ever so much, all of you. Very practical, very visionary, um, great ideas. Please, if people have questions, put them in the Q and A because even if there's not time to answer them now, we can see them and we can make sure you get your answers later. Thank you very much indeed. I, I know we're slightly before time. I don't know if, if John Soldatus is, is, is in the room. Yes, good. So uh, our next session, again, really fascinating, very interesting, IoT and edge computing. I'll just pass over to you, John, so that you can take over. Thank you.